Welcome to the show. In this one, I have a conversation with musician Emma Hill. Emma is a prolific Alaska folk singer and songwriter. She released her first album when she was 19. Since then, she's released seven full-length albums, a live album, and two EPs. The focus of her music has always been introspective, focusing on healing and recovery, and more recently, mental health. She says that she's always been a hard-in-your-sleeve songwriter, and that a lot of her music focuses on heartache in one form or another. Okay, here's where I give the company men a shout-out. These are the people who have subscribed to the Crude Patreon for $50 or more. Trina Duber, Seward Brewing Company, The Grind Coffee Shop in Juneau, Derek Adolph, Blue and Gold Board Shop, Sharon Liska, Alaska Surf Adventure, and Aquila Space. Thank you to all the Patreon subscribers. This podcast wouldn't be possible without you. If you subscribe to the Crude Magazine Patreon, thank you. Your money helps keep these conversations going. So if you enjoy these conversations, you can subscribe at www.patreon.com slash crude magazine. That's patreon.com slash crude magazine. And pick the subscription tier that works for you. Okay, back to Emma Hill. Emma's worked as a traveling musician since 2006, so it makes sense that her live performance has evolved. When she was younger, her set was more planned. She got on stage and sang her songs. Nowadays, her performances are mostly spontaneous. As an example, she points to the Spinard Song Circle, a monthly event Emma hosts. She says that it's more than just a concert. It's a safe space to talk about the feelings and experiences behind songwriting. So here she is, Emma Hill. <laughs> this red light right here, it means we're recording. Okay, fired up. Crude conversations. Listen more, then you talk. Go to work! Although we're both in Anchorage, we're actually recording this conversation remotely right now because of the quarantine. That's true. So these are wild times we're living in. It's, yeah, it's totally surreal. It's very, very strange times. How is it going for you? Are you quarantining? Yeah. Um, basically, my only times out of the house are to go on walks and, of course, keeping uh, my distance from any other people other than I am quarantined with my my sweetie because he and I live together. So Spencer's here, and I'm really thankful for that. I can't even imagine the folks who are totally by themselves. That's that's tough. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you could do it for a month or two? Um, <laughs> I'm having to just kind of take it day by day, because if I kind of focus on that reality, since it's becoming more and more apparent that that is our reality, I definitely get a little, a little overwhelmed, mm -hmm. but it's also like, it's, um, for me anyways, it's not at all like, oh, I think it's a ridiculous thing they're asking. I, I absolutely believe it's absolutely what we need to be doing. It's the only way we're going to flatten this curve. And it's already, um, you know, something that unfortunately it looks like we should have done a lot sooner, but um, just as far as like human and my, I'm a very extroverted person. So yeah, it's definitely not an ideal lifestyle for me, but I'm making the most out of it. <laughs> Trying to anyway. You know, I saw on Facebook that you live streamed a concert from your home the other day. How did that go? It was actually, it was really amazing. I've never done a live stream concert. Um, I've never really done anything with a live feature on Facebook before. So it was uh, yeah, I just kind of went into it like, well, I hope this sounds all right. Um, <laughs> I definitely have been taking in some this week or in like the week leading up to it. And so I could, from the little bit that I was picking up, it seemed that folks were trying to stream from multiple like social media accounts at the same time. And what I was able to tell was clearly which one they were using their phone for and which one they were using their laptop for. And the phone was obviously much better, uh, visual and audio. And so I decided just to choose one and send everybody over there so I could just use my phone. And all the feedback I got from that, from folks said that that really helped, that, that actually the sound was pretty good. So yay, iPhone. So you were eliminating certain technological things in order to 
kind of determine which one was the best? Yeah, just because I'm <laughs> I'm a musician and I I. I love that part of my life, but I'm not like a, I'm not like my bandmate. He's a recording engineer. And so he's an amazingly talented musician, but he's also like a super audio nerd. So I don't actually even have like a basic setup of microphones to use like on my computer, which right now I'm realizing, hmm, maybe I should really consider getting at least like a basic condenser mic or something to put that plugs directly into my laptop if I continue to do future live stream things. But, um, yeah, so I just kind of had to play around with it. I've recorded a couple of videos like in advance just to kind of see about how far away to have the 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 phone so it wasn't maxing out. And I do have a really loud voice when I go up into like my really big like higher notes and stronger notes. And so I kind of just purposely leaned back and kind of faced the opposite direction of the microphone. <laughs> and uh, it seemed to work. So, <laughs> You know, what I was wondering is – is this where your mind went when you were like, okay, I can't travel to perform, so I'm going to do this live stream thing? I feel like I started seeing that other people were doing the live stream concerts. And so um, it's not anything, like I said, I have not done any live stuff, so it wasn't my first thought to go there. But it's I could tell that people were reacting to it and having a good response. And... I chose this last weekend because it was supposed to be my first set of shows after returning to state from being gone all winter. And I had two sold out shows out in Palmer um, last weekend that of course got canceled due to everything. And so that's kind of, I was like, well, I was supposed to play two shows back to back um, as kind of my welcome home. And so I decided to just do the live stream on Sunday afternoon because that's, I was doing, I was supposed to be doing a, a Sunday matinee. Um, so that's kind of why I chose to finally just like, well, I'm going to do something. And then the response was amazing. So I'm definitely going to be doing some more. So your, your homecoming shows got canceled because <laughs> of COVID-19. And so you actually did a homecoming show from your home. It's true. Yeah. Um, which I mean, let me tell you, we barely made it home. So I was very, very thankful that that's where that was coming from. Um, we uh, shortened our trip as things started to progress and we could tell that, uh, well, I had a feeling that the, the Canadian border was going to be closing. And so we, um, and once I just kind of saw what was happening, we were in Portland and, uh, I just told Spencer, Hey, I think we need to go now. And so we left Portland about three or four days earlier than originally planned and basically just drove, um, directly to the border and then made our way up the Alcan and uh, we really lucked out because basically once we made it over to the Alaskan side was the the day that they announced that they were going to be closing the Canadian border of course now since then they've said maybe they'll be allowing Alaskans through there's like been some back and forth but as far as like anyone just having no problem getting into Canada it was like basically right at that time that they were like yeah we're going to be pretty much saying no unless you can explain to us why you absolutely have to so yeah Really thankful to be home. Wow, that's crazy. So you guys were almost stuck in Canada? <laughs> it kind of sounds that way. I mean, I was more afraid that they, we weren't going to get into Canada. Um, I figured that's kind of why I told Spencer. I said, let's go ahead and get across the border because I knew they weren't going to keep us there. Like, I figured if we get to the Alaskan border, they're not going to say, no, we, they're going to send Americans over to American soil. I don't think they want to deal with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So we were messaging the other day, uh, and you said that you work in tourism. I actually have rental properties that I run as uh, Airbnb rentals um, and have since 2016. I started with one property that was also my house, and then I basically rented it when I was out on tour. And that was how, as a musician, I was able to both afford and justify having a mortgage and that went really well for me. And after Spencer and I got together and we decided to buy a place together, we bought a duplex. And so we live in one part of the duplex and also use the other unit as an Airbnb rental. So um, normally I have two full-time B&Bs that I rent to like traveling nurses and stuff during the winter. But this month is usually when high season starts. And so we had the calendars completely booked 
for the end of March and April. And all of those bookings, of course, got canceled because, well, mm-hmm. travel has been canceled. So, yeah, we had to um, kind of quickly figure out what to do. But we thankfully got some short-term renters in there. And I was just really upfront with them about it being month to month while we watch and see what happens because um, – those are my main source of income outside of music. So if if it looks like there's going to be any sort of a recovery for our season, which right now it's looking a little doubtful, but if there is, then I've explained to them, you know, I'll have to be able to bump it back over to use as a, as a B&B. But I'm just really thankful. We got some really nice folks in both the units and the mortgage is paid for April. <laughs> so feeling thankful there. You know, I, I'm wondering how long did it take you to – kind of come to the realization or come to the conclusion that you're going to need some help as a musician with, you know, the monthly bills. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been a professional musician for like 14 years and I've done a lot of different schedules with it. I've had it at times when I was just out on the road almost constantly and Mm -hmm. had my stuff in storage and didn't really have a place. And then I've had stuff where I was a roommate in a house and I basically, you know, paid for my room while I was gone on tour and justified, you know, kind of it as a storage unit. So I didn't have, you know, as a, as a place for my things to exist. So I had a home to come to when I got off tour. But back in 2016, I decided I wanted to have uh, more of a space that I really felt like was my own. And I did a lot of, um, kind of calculations on how I could make that work. And luckily that was kind of right around the time that Airbnb was becoming a thing up here. And so I, yeah, I just kind of told myself, Hey, like you need to buy a house. And then the moment you buy it, like you need to approach it as being a shareable space. So set it up, you know, make it cute, make it, make it yours, but also know that, when you're not there, other people will be there. And if you play your cards right, that'll pay the mortgage. So mm-hmm. that's kind of where it started. And uh, it went really well for me. I mean, as a musician, I've worked a bunch of odd jobs over the years. Um, the only actual company besides my family's company that I worked for since I was a kid uh, that I worked for for a couple of years was actually Anchorage Yoga or Anchorage Yoga and Cycle now. They were awesome for a couple of years. I, I just worked their front desk Um and helped around the yoga studio and they were really they were the only company that I've ever like felt comfortable approaching and was just totally upfront about my tour schedule and basically they just said as long as I gave them plenty of notice that I they would you know block me off on the calendar and have my job waiting for me when I got back so that was that was a really awesome opportunity because it kind of let me have a little bit of that normal nine to five when I was home that I've not really ever had and um you know, that was, that was several years back now, but that was, that was a cool experience. But otherwise I've always just had to do, um, side hustle work as far as I've done everything from dog sitting, dog walking, house cleaning, nannying, babysitting, things that are gigs because, um, you know, I leave for chunks of time Mm -hmm. and most companies aren't really down with that. (laughs) Well, it's lucky that you found one at a certain point and then now you kind of made your own. Yeah, yeah. I realized even that was gonna that was probably not sustainable. It was really nice of them. It was a great opportunity. It was fun at the time. It was also like the great way for me to have access to an awesome yoga studio that I couldn't normally justify of like affording. <laughs> uh, so there was like some perks in it for sure. Mm-hmm. But yeah, basically when I started the B and B, um that was kind of my way of finally having some financial stability and independence. Because of course, being a musician, it's gig work and so some seasons are really great, others not so much, and a lot of it is making a lot of money in a short amount of time and then t- making sure that money like carries you through the rest of the months. Um, and so Airbnb really helped me have a little bit more, even though it's also it's more of a seasonal thing for sure, but at least within that season, I was able to know a little bit better about what my finances were going to look like for the year. So yeah, it's it's... Um, until COVID, it's been a pretty, uh, you know, it's, it's a big job. It's managing it and cleaning the units and just keeping it all going. It's, it's definitely a lot of work, but it's, it's also given me a lot of freedom and, uh, definitely more, um, financial comfort that I've ever known as an adult. So earlier you said that you've had a lot of odd jobs, including things like dog walking. Do you have any 
kind of memorable stories from those times? <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love, I love dogs for me. I realized like for a little while I was like, wow, why didn't I like realize this earlier? So I kind of used to joke about, um, shortly before meeting Spencer and I'm like single and I had the cottage over in Spinard, which is one of my units and which is where I was living at the time. And I got back from a trip and I realized, oh, there's this thing called Rover. My friend was telling me about it. And I was like, oh, and there was dog walking, which I was like, all right, cool. Like walking dogs is one thing. But then I got into like the dog sitting thing and I was like so proud of myself. I was like, oh my gosh, I can get paid to sleep at other people's houses and snuggle their dogs <laughs> and also get paid to not sleep at my house because then someone else can sleep there. And I was just like... I thought I had just like cracked the code. I was like, oh my God, this is it. Like I found it. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, and it was, it was a great little period of time. And then of course, you know, there's things that come in. Like I have a partner now and I love my house and I'm a little bit more like in kind of nest mode in our space and everything. But even he was really into it for a while. Like he has, I will say like he's, uh, even last summer we were saving up for a big trip and he was really awesome about going and doing dog sitting gigs with me and stuff so we could rent out more of our spaces. <laughs> That's a tough life. My wife uh, did some dog sitting when we lived in Reno for college and, you know, packing up your house and or packing up your apartment in our case and going and, you know, staying at somebody's house for, you know, a week, two weeks is like, I think it takes a certain type of person, you know, which I am not. <laughs> Well, luckily for me, yeah, I am way more that person <laughs> than Spencer is, but that's kind of to be expected because I mean, I've been a touring musician for years and I'm definitely very experienced of how to live out of a suitcase for weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. um, but it is nice when I'm home. It's, it's kind of funny. I always tell people, I'm like, yeah, you do a lot of odd jobs and like, I know what I'm willing to do. And I also know it's nice to know that those things are always like available. I mean, in, in normal times. Um, but also it's like, it's also nice to like grow and like know as you get older and stuff, like what's worth your time and what's not worth your time or like what sacrifices you're willing to make for money and others that you're like, no, I'd rather do something else. And I don't know. I, li I like that I've kind of played the field, if you will, with side jobs because um, like I know I'm really good with kids, but it's not like my go-to anymore. I'm like, yeah, if I really need to make money on the side, I'd probably like be way more stoked to go hang out with other people's dogs than like take care of their kids. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, there are a couple really rad kids that I still will like, babysit for, but they're just like my friends. So I just like enjoy hanging yeah. out with them legitimately as humans. So I'm like, cool. I guess like the money on the side is a bonus. <laughs> so something that you just said earlier is um, being a musician is gig work. And it actually seems like that transcends to the rest of your life as well. Yeah, I mean, it does because, I mean, a lot of musicians don't necessarily do that. They can, you know, if it depends on how much you tour. Like if you're at home most of the time, then a lot of musician friends that I have are able to have nine to five jobs. But I've been, you know, I travel for chunks of time. So, I mean, I kind of always have to have gig work and like I said the the B&B &B thing is like the most stable kind of like more um steady income I've I've ever had uh but yeah as you can tell right now is a real uh, questionable time for me because the gig work is not it's not really happening right now mm -hmm. in any form <laughs> yeah it'll be interesting to see where we end up yeah, I think it's especially interesting to, I'm just, I'm curious about, you know, um, what Alaska looks like, even just with one season. So, and again, you know, we're early enough, I don't want to like curse anything, but it's looking like we will probably have, if not entirely, like an entirely canceled summer season as far as industry, uh, a very close to that. And, uh, you know, that's such a huge part of Alaska and the economy and kind of everything about a period will be very interesting to see how that goes. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I actually was thinking about that earlier today. I mean, you you basically said it much better than I was thinking it, which is, you know, we're looking at 
potentially an entire summer without all of the things that make up summer in Alaska, including tourism, right? Which is a, a big portion of you know economic income for the state, and we're not going to be getting that. So it'll be interesting to see kind of the after effects of all that. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, um, you know, I know there's, there's so many people hurting right now um, financially. And I definitely am like been thinking a lot about all of the small business owners that I know and love and I know are like really freaking out right now. And I, I hope that all the, you know, the loans and the different things, I hope some of this, this relief that they're supposedly being promised, I really hope it comes through for folks because, you know, I just, I love this city and I love all of our, um, I don't know, our entrepreneurial spirit. Like it's a big thing. And I, especially in the last few years, I just, you know, it's like, I've got some of my best friends are small business owners and I'm really just hoping that uh, everybody can pull through and, and come out on the other side, whatever, whenever and whatever that looks like, I hope can come out on the other side and keep their doors open. Because I think it's part of what makes our city so cool is that we have so much local stuff going on. So in addition to working in tourism, you're a traveling musician. Do you usually tour throughout Alaska, the States, or does it change from year to year? Uh, yeah, I kind of have it down to a little bit of a system. Um, I try to never tour outside of the state like during the summer because that's kind of the whole reason I live here still. Is I, I just think there's no better place on the earth than Alaska in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a really great time to be a musician up here. It's definitely my busiest season. Um, you know, a combination of events and day festivals and multi-day festivals and downtown stuff and tourism. Therefore, you know, the restaurants are extra busy and they usually have a little bit better uh, music budget during that time. So I do a lot of solo shows, just kind of like some of the more typical shows, like my I, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, playing at one of the breweries or restaurants or something like that. But then I also, my bandmate Brian lives down in Portland, Oregon, and he's been playing with me for like 12 years now, 13 years now. And so I fly him up. We usually do like more of an actual run of shows at least once in the summer. And that will oftentimes include like our Fairbanks, our, you know, our one big show in Fairbanks for the season and our Denali shows. and Sometimes it coincides with the state fair, so we'll do our state fair shows, and then we have a collection of house concerts that we do, and then we'll usually do like one big show in Anchorage, you know, a ticketed show of some kind. Um, so that's usually kind of like my one big summer season run with him, and then of course I play a bunch of stuff throughout the season solo, but whenever I travel outside of state, I bring him with me as well. So like, for example, this year... We did an East Coast run followed directly by a European run. And so I met up with him in New Orleans and we did a uh, Folk Alliance, which is a conference slash festival. And we played that and hung out there and then played shows, driving and playing shows all the way up to New York City and dropped off the rental car and then flew into Berlin and then did a three week run around primarily Germany. But we did a couple Switzerland and um, Austrian dates as well. That's awesome. Had you performed in Europe prior to this? Yeah, it was my fourth time and my third time getting to bring Brian with me. And then Brian has been over there a couple of other times with other acts as well. Do you have a maybe a ritual or something you do kind of before you go on stage? Hmm. Um... It really just kind of depends. Not for me, not not like a no, I wouldn't say there's like one exact thing. Um it kind of depends on what the stage is and like how big the crowd is. If it's a bigger show, like we had a really big show, we got to open for a group in uh when we were in Washington DC this last trip and so we were playing like I don't know, it was like maybe a 500 or 600 person room and it was sold out and so it was bigger bigger than our normal show and I definitely that was like you know we had a green room things that are not normal yeah <laughs> for us. And so I kind of like definitely was a little bit more nervous like kind of went through you know I do a lot of yoga so I like kind of use that same kind of breath work sometimes to calm my nerves but 
it's interesting when that happens for me. It's kind of exciting, actually, because I don't really get nervous. I haven't for a long time uh, performing in general. Um, I, I love being on stage in front of people. But yeah, a couple of those bigger ones, it's funny because like I'll notice it. I'm like, oh, I kind of have like butterflies. Like this is exciting. Like <laughs> I'm a little out of my comfort zone, which I think, you know, life should always be a little bit about at least occasionally stepping outside of your comfort zone. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't know. For me, I don't drink alcohol anymore. And so it's just like, and even when I did, I never was a, I was never really down to drink pre-show. I used to drink after the sh- after the set, but um, no, it's always just like making sure I'm super hydrated, making sure, like I don't eat, I try not to eat within an hour of when I have to sing. I try to make sure that I've like done some stretches and stuff so that my neck doesn't get all weird and kinked up from having the guitar on. Um, yeah, I don't know. So you don't know why you don't get nervous anymore? Um, I just think I've been doing it for a long time and I, I enjoy, I don't know, for me getting on stage is just more of like, there's an interaction happening. I I play a lot of like listening room shows primarily, right? And so it's less about like putting on a performance or a big show and it's more about connecting to my audience. So, Mm -hmm. and for me, that's very comfortable. I, I, I enjoy the power that lies in vulnerability, both being vulnerable and reminding other people it's okay to be vulnerable. And so I tell a lot of the stories behind the songs and I try very much to have it be this um, flow of energy going back and forth between me and my audience. And then when Brian's with me, like he and I have our little banter and jokes and stuff. And so that's kind of fun. And I don't know, I just try not to take it too. uh, I mean, I take it seriously as far as like, I'm very proud of my craft and, and I'm very like honored to be up there performing, but I try not to take it too seriously as far as like, I don't know, I'm not some big showman. I'm just me, mm-hmm. <laughs> if that makes sense. So I wrote this down uh, just now. I just, I wrote this down just now um, and I hope you don't mind answering it, but you said that you don't drink anymore. Is there a reason for that? Oh yeah, I uh, definitely was an alcoholic. <laughs> um, oh okay. Uh, I've been I've been sober from alcohol for uh, three and a half years now. Congratulations! Which is nice. Thank you. Yeah, it was a big uh, it was a big move for me. Um, I was not like your drink every day alcoholic. I was definitely a bit of a binge drinker. I definitely used it for self-medication for a long time, which I don't, I think I kind of knew, but I was in denial about, I definitely suffer from mental illness and have since I was pretty young. And I think I used it in social settings as a way to like combat social anxiety and then just anxiety in general. And, um, yeah, it just took me, it took me unfortunately longer than it should have, but I finally, um, Figured that I was going to be a whole lot better off without it. For sure. And I'm not anti-alcohol. I, I I still love to. I still love parties. I love going out. I love being out and with friends. And I'm absolutely okay with people that are able to um, indulge in a safe way. I do think it is absolutely uh, way more often than it's not being done in a safe or healthy way. But you know that we live in a society that doesn't like to bring that up because there's a lot of money surrounding alcohol in our society. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, you know, um, I think everybody knows their own limits and I wish I had realized mine a little bit sooner, but I'm very thankful that I did when I did and, uh, definitely don't, don't regret. I mean, I don't ever look back. I'm happy to know that I won't ever drink again. And it's a nice feeling to have gotten that far with it. What was that? moment like when you realized that you know you didn't want to drink anymore well there were a lot of those moments I had I made it about a year one time and then went through a pretty intense uh part of or some events in my life and I ended up falling off the wagon and started drinking again and um it took me a while probably about a year and a half between that big break and then finally realizing um, 
I really needed to quit and quit for good. And I don't know, man. Um, I had some amazing people in my life, luckily, that were also, they loved me enough to be really honest with me and say that they were worried and concerned. And um, and I had known it for a while. It's just about waking up and it's like basically being like brave enough to like take the first few steps. I mean, recovery mm-hmm. from anything, it's, it's, it's a cra- it's a just a weird thing because before you can even do any of the steps, it's really just about like having a very real conversation with yourself and being like, are you ready to make a change? Because that's, if you're not like you, you can try and you're going to, you can do a lot of different things that you think are moving you in the right direction. But if you haven't actually like committed to change, then it's going to be a pretty hellish, <laughs> hellish road. Mm-hmm. So I was thankful that I, even though it took a lot of like pain and a lot of pretty messed up situations to get me there, I was pretty thankful to at least finally have that aha moment of like, like you're done. Like there's no, it was like, basically for me, I had to just take it off the table entirely. It wasn't like, I couldn't do that thing of like, oh, I should like cut back or, oh, that that just really needs to be something for special occasions. It was like, no, for me, after all of my my experiences, I finally just had to be like, this is no longer <laughs> an option for you. Mm-hmm. And that's when I think I finally, something about when I finally made that decision and, and clearly made it for myself and my, in my, you know, to myself, that's when I was actually able to do all the other stuff that it takes to actually quit something. Did it feel liberating at all when you eventually pulled the trigger on just like, all right, I'm done with this. Like, this is not happening. Did it feel like, did it feel liberating at all? It, there was definitely a level of that. I wouldn't say, I would say that that came a little bit later down the road. There was a lot of like fear and like anxiety that I wasn't actually going to be able to hold to my own guns and all that, all that in the initial, but like absolutely, but a little bit, I think somewhere in the back of my head, I also realized that I meant it. And there was totally some like a liberation in that because Mm -hmm. there was just kind of this, like, I don't know, this like little part of me, this glimmer, I guess that I could feel that like, I really meant it. And so I don't think I wanted to like, jump the gun and get too excited. But I, you know, I'll say that, you know, as the months went on and I was able to count my one month and my two month and then by the time I made it to six months, it was like, yeah, I was so, I just, the freedom that comes from my, like when you have something that really weighs on you mm-hmm. and you don't realize it. I mean, I'd had tr- problems with alcohol since I was like a young teenager. And so it just was how, you know, I had, I had drank more than I had not drank. If that meant, you know, like I had mm-hmm. been a drinker more than, you know, for longer than not. And to finally just like be free of that was, yeah, it was, it still is an amazing feeling to just know I'll never be hungover again. I'll never wake up like confused or full of shame or, you know, I don't know. There was just a lot of things that for me anyways came with that addiction that just, I, I don't know. I just know I don't have to feel that way anymore. And it's so good. (laughs) You know, I'm, I'm a big list maker. I'm always, you know, writing things down. And whenever I have to make an important decision, I usually, you know, uh, I'll have a pros and cons list or, you know, I'll write a paragraph or, you know, I I kind of put something down so that it's tangible. Are you at all like that? Or was it friends that kind of confronted you about it? And eventually you just agreed with them. And, you know, I need to start getting healthy. Uh, it was a combination of both, but yeah, it was a lot of, uh, absolutely writing things down and starting to get to a point where I was like, you have to like really figure out what it is you want. And that was kind of the first step. I was a weird, like, it's interesting how recovery, like there usually tends to be like a substance or an action or whatever it is that you're addicted to. But for anyone who's gone through recovery, you realize that it's it's a lot more about growth and and healing past trauma. And so getting the addiction out of the way, that's just like it's a it's a I'm not at all like making small of it. Like it's it's a very big part of the step. But it was like this huge process of me actually figuring out what I wanted in my life, if that makes sense. Um and that's tough to say that out loud too, because I mean I was like 27, right? And I'd already had like pretty successful career and other things. I was really lucky, you know, that I had uh, never let my addiction get in the way of um, music and things like that. But as far as just like who I was as a person, it like, 
basically forced me to sit down and yeah, like you said, like write out lists of like, what is it that you really want? And Mm -hmm. what are these things that you're just not going to accept anymore, both from people around you and from yourself? And um, yeah, I think it was writing down those lists and then holding myself accountable. And it's kind of funny for me. I, uh, I was single at the time. And so I was just kind of like thinking of things to like, get me excited and like little like gifts for myself basically. And I will say I, I did that. I wrote out a list. It was like, if you can make it to one month, you get this. And if you can make it to two months, you get this. And I, uh, I'm happy to say, you know, I made it to all of those marks and I got all of those little prizes or gifts to myself. And each time, like it felt really, it was like very satisfying to like check it off and to like get that. And I don't know, I'm a pretty frugal person. So for me, they were, I really like made them like, very special things for for me if I could make it. And so, I mean, I don't want to say that that's the only reason I stuck with it, but I, I do know that they like, they really helped like with me being like, no, you've got this. Like also for sure, <laughs> just like, hold on <laughs> because, um, yeah. No, that's great. I, um, I feel like I don't buy myself stuff very often. Uh, if I have something and it works, I'm not going to get a new one of those things. You know, it's just like, I, I got it. Yeah, that's that's definitely me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, it works. <laughs> I don't need anything. Um, so, yeah, I can see that definitely being an incentive to to keep on that path. Um, one thing I was thinking about as you were talking is I had a prescription to Adderall for a very long time. And I think that that's one of those kind of undercover like drugs because it's uh, prescribed by a doctor. And so you kind of have this like, go ahead by the doctor to be like, okay, I can take this and it's okay. And so I was fine with it when I was younger. And then as I got older, um, I don't know this for certain, but I imagine as you get older, you know, your body chemistry changes, right? And so it started having kind of these, these negative effects on me. I started getting really uh, nervous and anxious and I felt like I couldn't do the writing that I needed to do and pursue the career that I wanted to pursue without taking that pill. And so I had tried to stop taking it about four times and on about the fourth time or the fifth time, I just like, you know, like you said, you just pull the trigger. You you made the list and you're like, okay, the pros outweigh the cons. Or not, not I'm sorry, other way around. The cons outweigh the pros. So I need to I, I need to quit this in order to pursue and succeed in the thing that I want to pursue and succeed at. And so I'm definitely feeling what you you're saying on on a personal level for sure. Well, I'm really glad that you got there, man. Um I think, you know, whatever you're whatever your battle is. And I think that in a lot of ways, like different folks go through that, like, and it, it does not, it's not always like a substance or whatever, but just like, yeah, get into a point in your life that you like set boundaries for yourself and, and make healthy choices. And, um, it's a great feeling. It's a, it's, it's a tough process, but when you get to their side of it, it's like something to be really proud of. And mm-hmm. it's like, um, you know, just seeing it through for yourself also, especially, you know, it's something for yourself and like really just being like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm worth the, putting the fight in for this and and seeing what it looks like on the other side. So that's awesome, man. And I think that immediately following that decision to, all right, I'm going to stop doing this thing. It doesn't feel really great in that moment. (laughs) It only feels like really, really, really great. Like a month later or two months later, or like you said, six months later, and you're looking back and all of that's kind of in this, this rear view. And you're just like, wow, I'm really proud of myself for doing that. Yeah, I always tell people because, you know, I have a lot of folks that have asked advice and stuff over the years now, um, specifically, of course, with quitting drinking. And and I always tell them, I'm like, yeah, no, like the first part is going to suck so bad because, <laughs> I mean, first of all, like what is drinking, right? Like it's a really, really serious form of escapism. And so especially not, – not always, but if you have a problem with it, that usually tends to – those two you tend to go hand in hand. And so it's like um, if you take that out of the equation, you're going to feel all the feels, like everything that you've been masking and everything you've been hiding and like kind mm-hmm. of covering up. Like it's all going to be there. And like usually, you know, <laughs> there's a reason you're trying to avoid some of that. Um, I always tell people it's just about – figuring out how to find healthier coping mechanisms for those things and, and how to process them and, and just not turn to, 
you know, the unhealthy ones that we used as, as crutches for so long. Um, but I will say if anyone's out there struggling, man, all I'll tell you is, um, and all I can talk for, for myself is, 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 is kicking booze, but, um, coming out on the other side of it, it's like, uh, it is the most amazing, like weightlifting feeling of just knowing like, ah, I'm never going to have a hangover again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm serious. It's so good. (laughs) Because hangovers get get rough the older you get. Yeah, <laughs> so true. And I wasn't even that old, but man, I'm telling you, like, I just it was. Yeah, they were not. It was not going well. Well, I can tell you, I am older than you were when you quit, and I've had a recent hangover, and they're not pretty. And I'm in my 30s, so <laughs> you're not missing anything. <laughs> Well, good. But yeah, I mean, one of the craziest things is, you know, a lot of folks, uh, like part of quitting drinking for me, I had to be pretty like careful with how I did it. And I, I, I'm really proud that I was, or like thankful that I was able to do it the way I did because from day one, I still made myself go and be around, um, drinking and bar situations. I, I always gave myself permission to like leave the moment that I got uncomfortable or anything. I had different little like things, but it was very, very important for me because of what I do for a living to be okay being in bars. And Mm -hmm. so that was kind of another added little challenge to it, but I'm really thankful for that because it just, it just doesn't bother me at all, you know, to be in, in situations where other people are drinking and, uh, yeah. So it didn't affect my, my gigs. Well, and that's tough to, continue to be around it um when you're trying to quit i mean that's like aa and na 101 it's like take yourself out of the situation that you were originally a part of oh i know man but it was just it was something that that was kind of like the deal i'd made with myself is Mm -hmm. that i had to do it that way and um it just you know i needed i needed to know i could still live my lifestyle and and make make money the way I make money and also like I love live music like I love to play music but I love going out to see shows of all kinds and and um that's something that's such a plus for me so I just told myself like you can't if you start to immediately like divide that like divide the two and say that your sobriety only exists because you're not in these spaces like Mm -hmm. I knew I was never gonna get that magical feeling of the live music and so I just like nope you'll just do it this way and make it work and I'm really glad because as yes sometimes being in the situations was difficult in the beginning the magic of like getting to dance with my friends and like be in the presence of like talent and and that was like also a huge part of my recovery so it would like it was one of those things definitely like the pros outweighed the cons on that one for me for sure well that's really great I'm, I'm really happy to hear that Emma So you had mentioned mental health earlier, and this next question is about that. So unfortunately, I've never been to one of your shows, but I was talking to my friend Dylan Vogt the other day, and he said that at a lot of your shows, you talk about depression, dark times, and the effect Alaska's dark winters have on people up here. When did you decide to start talking about these issues at your shows? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, it was a while back, and it's kind of crazy to think that there were so many years where I didn't make it like a big focus of them. But also, I think I had to like, like anything, I had to just get to a place of being comfortable talking about it, and and really realize that being open and vulnerable about these things was not a weakness. It was very much like it was actually going to, it was going to be helpful both to myself and then also to, um, the audience. Um, I, you know, we talked earlier, I think sometimes, you know, it's good to put yourself out of your comfort zone. And for some people like being in an open space, like being at a public place and then having someone all of a sudden be talking about like some really real stuff, like mental illness can kind of, you know, it can make them a little uncomfortable, but it's also like a lot of connection that happens in those moments of being like, no, really, it's okay. Like, we're just going to talk about this for a minute. And for me, talking about mental health and my own struggles with mental illness was a huge part of 
I basically was like, okay, if I'm going to be on a stage and commanding attention from a group of people, whether it be, you know, a small room at a house concert or a larger venue, I felt like I needed to do my part in like talking about something that I felt like mattered. And for me, that is talking about the fact that we have to start talking more about mental illness in our society and all Mm -hmm. over the world. And I right away got such a, like a powerful response from it that I realized I was doing the right thing. And it was, it like was a little harder in the beginning and now it's gotten easier and easier. But the fact that there's like so much stigma and shame surrounding mental illness in our society is why people that struggle with it are like not nearly as likely to ask for help when they need it. There's like a really big cloud of shame and and it's like surrounds the person themselves. And then of course, throughout history, it's, you know, it's supposed to be like the shame. There's like the shame that happens to the person who's actually ill, which is really frustrating because, you know, that person is already dealing with a lot of um, hindrances, but like, then it's like clouded kind of around the people close to them, especially like their family members, like this idea of like, oh, well, you know, you're, you've got this family member that has this, this, this problem. And I guess for me, I just think it's kind of ridiculous since we know so much about mental illness now. Of course, there's so much we still don't know, which is frustrating. But we do know that it's a disease of the brain and your brain is an organ. And there's all these diseases that exist that are chronic illnesses that people have where one of their organs doesn't function properly. So this idea that when people have a brain that doesn't function properly is like this mystical, like, oh, I don't know, like we shouldn't talk about it because that's bad. It's like, no, that just means that there's 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 medications, there are processes, there are like professional folks that their job is to know what to do in these scenarios and how to make life as livable as possible and as normal as possible for people that have an organ that's not working right. So the idea that like we have shame surrounding someone who has to take antidepressants, it's like you're not going to walk up to someone that like is diabetic and be like, oh my gosh, like, do you think you're going to have to be on that insulin for the rest of your life? Like, that's, that's terrible. It's like, well, yeah, that's unfortunate, but it's also, there's not like a sudden shame about it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whereas you walk up to someone and you're like, oh wow, I didn't realize you took, you take antidepressants. Like, um, I'm sorry. And it's like, well, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's just when you put the work in and you figure out, you know, the imbalances that you're dealing with, and you have a doctor that also is like helping you with that. It's just another illness and it's not fun. I mean, no illnesses are fun, Mm -hmm. but it's very doable and it's very manageable and it's something. And I think the only way to get it to a point where more people see it that way is to start talking about it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, So I sing about it a lot because I'm a very like hard on my sleeve songwriter and I've always sung in my songs you know these elements of darkness and stuff but actually talking about like being open about those times or those like situations I've been in and then like showing this song that I got out of it was like a way of healing and a way of like reminding other people that maybe are struggling with similar feelings and don't have a way to express it and feel very alone or very isolated Mm -hmm. if that makes sense so that's that was like I feel like it's maybe been like seven seven years or so maybe like six or seven years since I really started shifting over to having it be something I talk about like pretty often these days it's almost at every show um just because I have songs you know that are are based around it or involved and so it at least comes up in like the story about the song Mm -hmm. I would imagine that your show has evolved and changed throughout the years and looking at it now it seems like it's come into its own. It's it's this wholly original show that is Emma Hill. Um, I mean, yes. Uh... <laughs> I mean, I didn't mean to say that to like gas your head too much. I just think that you being an Alaskan artist and then talking about those things, you know, while playing music, kind of intermittently going back and forth, I think is it's a, uh, I mean, it's almost like a public service, especially if you're doing something like that during like January and February, you know, when we're all feeling it. Well, I appreciate, yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I, I started a show, um, called Spinard Song Circle a couple years ago and, and I was actually scheduled to start it back up when I got home, but that's also something that is currently on hold. But 
it's something I wanted to do specifically to highlight vulnerability, basically. And so it's always me and then two special guest songwriters. And a lot of times they're local, but sometimes I've lucked out and got some touring musicians and stuff to come and be on it as well. But um, we basically tell the story behind every song. And then I always start the show off by just like rambling about something I've been thinking about or something I've been feeling lately. And it kind of sets a little bit of like a theme, but I also am like, but if you're not feeling it, like no one's, there's no like, there's no rehearsal. There's no like, no, no lines like that. You All I ask is for the artist to like tell the story behind the song. And so it's turned into this really powerful thing that like once a month, I'm just like gathering with like an audience and then whoever these guests are. And it's a concert, but it's really more like a safe space to talk about the feelings behind songwriting and the experiences behind songwriting. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it's like, as far as production, like things that I've been involved, like making happen and like kind of brought into like fruition, it's my favorite project I've ever done. Um, And it's tough. I don't, I guess I don't, I I think of it in kind of a different way as as far as live shows, like I'm not going to compare it to like, you know, an album or something, but just something about an opportunity because the feedback I've gotten from it, like you said, it becomes this kind of very cathartic space where like the artists and the audience, we have everything from like, I've had shows where like the entire place is roaring in laughter, like, like doubled over, like belly laughs in one part of the show. And then also like sobbing in other parts of the show, like not kidding, like looking out and seeing like every single person just like really like release crying. and. I don't know. I think there's something kind of magical in that. Like, I know it's not for everyone, but the people that have found it seem to like really need it and they continue to come back. And um, so I don't know if it's a public service, but it's really just for me. um, I think music is this really powerful thing. And, and so, yeah, as far as going back to like the evolution of like you say, yeah, I think you know, I started really young. I started performing out when I was 17. I put my first album out when I was 19. And when you're still that young, you know, you're still pretty narcissistic. Like you haven't like experienced enough yet to really like go outside of your own like hopes and like desires and dreams and stuff. And it's been kind of cool for me to realize that those connections and like some of those things on a smaller and intimate level, like those like those are my current like hopes and dreams is to like create more things like that and, and, and continue doing things like that. And it is a very different look for myself than I think I had like aspired when I was like a young artist, like thinking I was going to become famous or I don't know, some large grandiose schemes I probably was playing into, but um, it's really fulfilling. It's like everything, like going around the world and talking about emotions <laughs> And how it's okay to talk about your emotions and then singing songs about my emotions. <laughs> it's like you said, it's the Emma Hill show and it's a lot about feeling your feels, but it's really fulfilling. It's really satisfying. And it makes me feel so connected to these humans that I'm in these rooms with. And even if I've never met them before, or um, even if I'm in a different country and they mostly speak another language, for whatever reason, it just transfers over. Like everybody just needs a good cry from time to time. <laughs> Do you have any specific stories, personal or otherwise, that you talk about during a performance? (sighs) Um, Well, I tend to talk about my recovery quite a bit, but I also have this, I have this song called Two Seconds Flat, and I wrote it like the week that I decided to quit drinking. It was the first song I wrote, but it was actually inspired by So shortly before quitting drinking, I had gotten into a new hobby and that hobby was rock climbing. And I was like really excited about it. I was like going every day and my friend Alicia had gotten me into it and we were doing some rope climbing, but we were doing a lot of bouldering. And I liked that too, because it meant I could go by myself if I needed to. And so when I just made that that decision to quit drinking, I was like, okay, this is, you're just going to like power your way through this. I was already really, I've always, or I, I've been into yoga for a long time, right? So I was already doing yoga a ton. And at the time I was doing hot yoga over at Anchorage Yoga. So 
I was like, you're just going to do yoga every day. You're going to climb like five times a week. You're just going to stay so active. You're just not even going to be able to focus on, you're not going to have time to think about drinking. (laughs) And then two days after making that decision, I was bouldering and I fell from the top of a route. So I was about 15 feet up and I fell. And of course there's padded floors, but I landed wrong and I busted my right ankle and busting it would have been still not fun, but uh, I also tore three ligaments in my ankle. So I basically was told like the next day that I was not going to be doing anything for a good long while. And so that song, Two Seconds Flat, was the first song I wrote post quitting drinking and post injury. And so I always tell that story because I basically was single. I couldn't walk. It was my driver's foot, so I couldn't drive myself around until I was, like, out of the – like, able to take the boot off. So it was, like – I, at the time, had three jobs because, you know, I have always doing that side hustle. So Mm -hmm. I, like, couldn't work at all. I was just, like, suddenly just, like, super, super aware of how much I had taken my mobility for granted. And so that song, it's it's about quitting drinking, but it's really, like, this song about gratitude and, like, how, like – You've got to be thankful for what you got when you got it because, like, you never know when life is going to throw, like, a different set of challenges your way. And sometimes they're going to be really big ones, like ones that just, like, flip your life upside down, which is really what that injury did for me. Um, But, man, talk about some silver lining. I got – I really made some growth (laughs) during that time of of physical – I was going through alcohol recovery and a very real physical recovery. And I don't know, man. It's – it was a tough time, but uh, it inspired a lot of music. And I always kind of tell an abridged version of that story when I before I sing that song because it's just like, um, it's basically the song is a metaphor of that fall. Like the the chorus like says like, um, it can take all day to climb to the top, but it's only two seconds flat when you fall. Like, it's just this idea of like, you know, you can be working towards something and think that you have all of your ducks in a row and you've made your plan and you know what you're going to do, but like, that's not how life works. Like mm-hmm. sometimes you're just going to get the, the rug pulled out and like, you better be ready to roll with the punches. When did you personally become comfortable with talking about mental illness? Um, well, I had to be okay with like, I mean, anybody in my, do you mean like publicly on stage or like just in general? Well, I would imagine it was kind of a progression type thing or a progressive type of thing, right? Where maybe you personally were like, okay, I, I'm I'm going to start talking about this with my family and my friends. And then, you know, that kind of evolved into what we've been calling the Emma Hill show, right? Where you're, <laughs> where you're talking about it publicly in hopes of it being kind of therapeutic or cathartic for other people. Yeah, I mean, um, I had been um, comfortable talking about it with the people close to me in my life for a long time because it's it's been a part of my life for a long time. Um, I was diagnosed pretty young. Um, I was 13 when I was diagnosed, and as far as they could tell, it actually had become something that I was dealing with really early onset, like around nine. Um, so it's it's always been – a demon of mine, if you will, that I kind of used to treat it that way. I'm only calling it a demon because when I was young, I didn't, I hadn't learned like everything I know now. And so I did, I had a ton of shame surrounding it. I was very upset. I always felt like it was like this weak part of me. I was just like, well, you know, yeah, okay. You're smart and you're driven and you're talented and you, you have all these things, but like, there's just this like part of you that comes out, you know, every now and then and just like crushes you. And it was, it's, it was hard. It was hard as a teenager. I mean, being a teenager in general is hard, (laughs) uh, adding a really intense level of like, um, up and downs with emotions. Cause I, I'm bipolar. So I have like crazy manic episodes and I wouldn't sleep and I would like cram for tests or like stay up all night writing songs. And then I'd go through other chunks of time where I just like, didn't want to get out of bed and like things. And, you know, as like a young person, it was just like, oh my gosh. So learning how to deal with that, it took a long time. And then unfortunately for me, because of the way I viewed it, I 
thought of it as a weakness. And so for me, I decided to not go like the tra traditional route. I took myself off medication when I was a teenager. And then I stopped seeing a therapist because I just was like, you know, I'm going to do this my way. And, you know, looking back on it, my way it pretty much led to me like having an alcohol problem because, you know, like you just like, if you're not having a great time, like go out and party, like everything will be fine. Like be around, you know, be around friends, like mm -hmm. lift yourself up, you know, like you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and stuff. And so, um, uh, many years of that. And then I think I was finally able to start talking about it during that time that I first took that big break from drinking because I think I had told myself that the whole reason I was so messed up was because I drank too much. And then when I quit drinking and was like able to stop drinking for a chunk of time and then realized I still was having like really serious bouts of depression, it was kind of the first time in a long time that I was like, yo, this is like on a much deeper level than that. Like you need to like seek out some professional help. And so I did that. And it that was like a total like game changer for me, like of just having a support network of medical, like mental health professionals to be like, yeah, like this is normal, like as far as like what you're experiencing, like within your diagnosis. And so I think just having to talk about it in more of this normalizing way made me learn a lot. And it also made me like, wow, well, if I've thought this my whole life, like how many other people are out there just like thinking that they just like have this curse that's like something they just have to deal with, like in whatever way possible. And I don't know, somehow in all of that, I started becoming brave enough to, to write more about it. And then through that, like to kind of talk more about it. Um, so that was like 2014, 2013. Do you remember what it was like that first time the the doctors, the medical professionals told you that, oh, this is a normal thing? Do you remember how, how it felt? Oh, like once I went, like once I went back in, like as an adult, um, yeah, it, it actually like, there was a lot of emotion to it. Um, it was a little, you know, it was a little crushing because of course I think part of or at least for me, I don't want to generalize. Something that I had trouble with for, for pretty much my entire life since since dealing with mental illness was because I'm bipolar, I go through these extremes. And part of, one of those extremes usually was when I'd be kind of on the up end of it, maybe not necessarily in like a full manic episode, but just kind of feeling good and feeling like pretty like, uh, you know, not and not in a depressive state. It's really, there's kind of this dangerous cycle that I used to live where I like, I would feel so good. And so I'd be like, oh, this is the time. Like I've cured myself. And you're just like, this is it. Like, oh my gosh. I like, I've like, basically you think you've like unlocked the, you know, whatever magic thing that somehow you'd like not been able to access your whole life. And so you kind of like get your hopes up about this idea that you're never going to have like another really bad low. So then when that low does hit, it's just kind of like, debilitating you're just like oh my god really like what the heck and so by getting in front of some professionals and being able to talk about that and have them really squash that and be like you're not seeing this the right way and all that's ever going to do is really torment yourself and really like bring on a lot of disappointment the idea is understanding that you're going to have like highs and lows and for me medication helps to really um make sure those stay like, you know, that my lows are not dangerous lows and that my highs are not dangerous highs and try to keep things pretty like um, even killed, if you will. But so the medication really helped. But for them to also just say, like, if every time you get to a good spot, you convince yourself that's the last time, then when you have a tough spot, you're just like really going to feel that extra amount of disappointment. Mm -hmm. And I think just like kind of getting a hold on that, that was the first step for me really, really taking my health, like my mental health uh, into my own hands of like a really serious level of being like, hey, you can do something about this, but like you have to stop like just riding the wave kind of like with your hands in the air. Like you need to like put the work in to like be your best self. And it, it is a lot of work. I, I mean, I always tell people that too, like recovery is a lot of work, but like recovery on top of like 
when you're, you know, when you struggle with mental illness is like, you got to be willing to do what it takes to like be your best self. <laughs> and um, I don't know, the more you do it, the, you know, the better practice you get and kind of, you know, what works, you know, what doesn't. And, um, but instead of just being blindsided all the time, you know, cause nobody, I mean, that's never fun no matter what it is. Right. So thinking about that, that moment with those, those doctors or that doctor and that, that feeling of, oh, it's, you know, this is normal. Do you feel like maybe that's what you're doing now, you know, with these, these Emma Hill shows is you're kind of getting up there and doing for the audience or, you know, one or two or three people that may need it in that audience. You're doing for them what that doctor did for you. Absolutely. I'm trying to normalize it as much as possible. I'm trying to destigmatize it. Um, I think that every time I'm open about my my personal story or one particular experience, um, I think it gives, hopefully will give somebody the power to at least ask a question about or like maybe realize, oh, like I, I dealt with that and I didn't really realize what was happening. Like, cause maybe they didn't, you know, no one had ever really described to them what a panic attack felt like or um, you know, what the, the different forms that anxiety can like take on. And so, yeah, my hope is always that by centering the shows a lot more around that, which I mean, there's other stuff I talk about, you know, whatever travels, you know, growing up in Bush, Alaska, there's all kinds of aspects to my show that are kind of part of, as you call it, the Emma Hill show. But that part of it, yeah, the whole hope is that you never know who's out there listening and you also never know who's out there struggling. And maybe it's just enough for them to be like, Hmm, maybe I should go see a therapist or "Hmm, maybe I should like look into this more. Maybe I'm actually like dealing with a thing here that like has like, you know, a medicine that helps or, or something like, because there's nothing worse than being in a depressive state or in a really severe like state of anxiety and then feeling like, no one else could possibly understand and you're all alone. And unfortunately, that's kind of part of, that's like a symptom of mental illness as your brain basically, it lies to you. It, you know, it makes you feel like you're a failure or that you're really weak or that no one else could possibly understand you, yada, yada. And so, yeah, I think there's a real power that can be offered to to people to just like tell them it's okay if they're having those feelings and that there are people out there that are going to be able to help them navigate those feelings. Oh, that's great. That's, that's all really great. We're kind of nearing the end here. And I was wondering if you had any stories from the road. So we've kind of talked about, you know, your show. And I think that it might be kind of fun to talk about, or at least have you tell us <laughs> kind of like a, an epic story from the road. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you a couple of like shorts, like just like quick ones. And then I'll tell you, cause they're, I'm like, man, I'm so lucky. I'm so fortunate. Like the people that I have come across in my travels and the connections that I've made have been so profound and just like totally like life changing for me. Um, but I, as far as like a few of the small ones that are not small. I'm not at all saying there's, but just like quick little examples of more, not the power of me, but I would say the power of music of, of when you're allowing yourself to be vulnerable with music. Like I've had people admit to me that, you know, albums of mine got them through divorces. I've had people admit to me that they've had songs of mine, just like help them through really depressive states. I had a gal basically like pull me outside after a show once she and I had never met. And she just kind of like, admitted to me that she like was dying from cancer and, and it was very intense and heavy. I mean, this is just a person she's she just asked, can I talk to you for a minute? And I don't know. I just, she didn't give me like a dangerous vibe. So I was like, okay. And she just like, basically just wanted to like talk for a minute about like, she basically, this was years ago and I was still really young. And this is before I even like was confident in talking a lot about like the emotions and the mental illness like I do now. But she just basically was like, I see something in you and I can see that you're like not afraid to talk about the real stuff. And she was just like, I'll tell you right now, like, don't ever stop doing that. Like, because it touches people. She was like, you moved me tonight. And 
yes, I'm emotional. And then she explained, she was like, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have very long to live, but it was just like this really powerful thing of, she just wanted to like, make sure that I knew that I was on the right path. Like, if that makes sense, you know, this total stranger, just like she saw right through me Mm -hmm. and was brave. And I thought it was really brave of her to come and talk. And it stuck with me for a really long time. Like, I mean, it still does, but I just like, just this person that she just really like, she really, I feel like shaped me at a time that I was still really young and didn't, you know, was still thinking, I think about a lot of things that didn't matter as much as the stuff as I realize now, but of what, what really matters in life. And that was pretty cool. Um, a fun story is I had a gal reach out to my PR agent many years ago who asked if I would watch a YouTube video that she had taken of her daughter playing ukulele and her daughter had taught herself my song, Meet Me at the Moon. And I was so excited. I'd never like had anything like that happen before. And so I watched it and it's like this girl on her 16th birthday, she'd gotten this ukulele and then she taught her that self this song. And so I reached out to the mother like privately and was just like, Hey, I just want to make sure you like tell your daughter she's crazy talented and I hope she continues making music. And I was just like, I was crying and blah, blah, blah. Well, that family went on to become like mega fans. And then they ended up hosting they found out that we do these house concerts because we play house concerts like all over, well, in Europe too. But, and so they had never, they had no idea really what a house concert was. They, I, I said, I was like, yeah, if you guys ever want to do a house concert. And so they like went out of the way to do all this research, figure out what, like, how to like be the best house concert host of like all time. And we played our first house concert with them like eight years ago now. And we, that family like became like family to me and Brian. Like we see them, we play at their house at least once a year. We've watched their kids grow up and go off to college. Um, We like know all their extended family. And I just, there's a lot of cool things like that that have happened to me. Like it's nuts. Mm -hmm. But that one, I think is just like one of the most magical, just like, I don't know, just the fact that my music touched someone, it inspired them to learn it them doing that really like touched my heart and then we like struck up a like basically a fanship that turned into a friendship that I now like consider that whole family like family so I don't know man I think uh music kind of has some power that way of just like skipping some of the weird in-betweens like you just feel you can feel really connected after a short amount of time yeah that's great that, I mean, that that's that's pretty much all I have for you, Emma. I mean, is there anything else you'd like to say? I mean, I, I'd like to I'd like to really thank you so much for being so open. And I've really enjoyed talking with you. But again, I mean, if you have anything else you'd like to say. I guess all, all I'll say is just, you know, it's crazy times right now. And we've talked about all this stuff. And this is stuff that I deal with during normal times. So I just I guess I want to just like remind people, like if you're out there, and you're dealing with like any bouts of just, I mean, there's going to naturally be a lot of anxiety and and sadness and heaviness happening in the world. So just like reach out, you know, whether it's to a friend or a family member, or maybe even consider there's like amazing what they're doing with like telehealth. Uh, I was able to talk to my therapist the other day through a telehealth conference. And that was like really huge for me because I have been dealing with a bunch of anxiety surrounding this Corona stuff. Um, so I guess I'll just say like, you know, we can sit here and talk it, but, um, I really, really, the reason I talk about it so much is I just want people to know, like, they're not alone if they're struggling and, um, to just, to just reach out. It's, it can be like a complete life-changing thing to just, to reach out for a little bit of help if you need it. For more information about how you can support local grassroots journalism, go to www.patreon.com slash crude magazine. Crude Conversations is written, hosted, and produced by me, Cody Liska, for Crude Magazine. Music was produced by Alcoda Beats. 